Um, okay, yeah, so my name's Ella from the Essex Back Group. I'm just going to talk to you um, about some of the projects that we're doing in Essex at the minute. So the first one is the Danbury Barber Cell Project. Um, so this was formally launched in spring 2019. Uh, so Danbury is located in the centre of Essex um, and it's part of a living landscape. Um, so the aim of the project was to produce um, a barber cell distribution map um, for the area to confirm the presence of one or more maternity colonies within Danbury, uh, to identify core roosting and foraging areas um, and commuting routes, um, but then also to provide habitat management and advice to landowners. Um, so the idea, um, so this is Graham Hart who's leading this project, and um, this is him out on the survey with uh, Alex, Jenny and Melissa. Um, so the idea of the project would that it would build year on year across three distinct phases. So phase one is acoustic surveys and endoscope surveys. Phase two uh, will add in trapping and phase three uh, will add in radio tracking. Now, Natural England approved uh, the project license in, at the end of 2019, but obviously due to the pandemic, um, we're still in phase one. But during phase one of the project, uh, we've carried out over 60 static detector deployments across 12 different sites. Sorry, my cat is just trying to get on the laptop. <laughs> um, we've recorded and analysed uh, in excess of 900 barber stone calls, carried out numerous transit surveys and emergent surveys, organised the back group's first tree climbing surveys, um, and we discovered a number of barber stone activity hotspots, um, including commuting routes, um, found the barber stones were still active during the winter, and recorded over 260 roost features that have the potential to be used by barber stell. Now, during the endoscope surveys, we did find a barber stell in a tree roost, um, which was a first for our group. Um, and obviously a lot of trees were surveyed um, and we found other roosts as well, uh, including for common and soprano pipistrels, uh, brown long-eared bats, natura's bats and nocturnal. So um, we've been doing tree roost surveys throughout other woodlands in Essex, which were inspired by Henry Andrews. Um, so these are using um, endoscopes. And as far as we're aware, prior to this, there were no tree roosts that have been found in Essex using endoscopes. So the surveys has really helped our group gain knowledge of the type of features being used by bats, when they're being used by bats and by which species. Um, and it's also helping protect them and raise awareness with the landowners. So in the two years since we started the surveys, we have found 30 roosts in trees, uh, found a total of 127 bats, um, that's eight of the 10 Essex species. Um, and it's also helped us do uh, regular monitoring of known roosts, which has generated a large amount of data. Um, well, yeah, and doing the surveys has generated a large amount of data on potential roosting features. Um, and it's also helped to train members on looking for these potential roosting features and surveying them with endoscopes. Uh, we have a really popular uh, bats and trees workshop every winter where we go around and, and sort of do the um, training with members and it helps engage them um, and provides training towards licenses. Some of the projects that I'm involved with um, is the um, is sort of hibernation monitoring of three different sites um, in the south of Essex. So um, this is called the wet tunnel uh, and it can get above welly height in the winter, which is what Lyndon and Marielle are modelling on the right there. They got very wet that, that day. Um, but yeah, so basically this is one of the tunnels and we put features in there, um, such as these boards, these horizontal boards on the wall, which are slightly lifted at the base. Um, and we get um, quite good numbers. So uh, you can see they've got common pipa strels, dabentons, bats, natura's bats, notice. Um, and we do get the odd brown long -eared. We've not had brown long bats for the last couple of years. Uh, and there is one unidentified bat because um, I think it had fallen in the water so it's quite hard to distinguish what that was um, but numbers have been quite good um, I've been doing this for about eight years now and they've probably doubled um, in that time uh, and this is one of the bats under the boards and then uh, just another project so the Essex Serotine project which started last year this um, was started up by Sarah Wiltshire um, and so basically She's looking at serotines and how the, what the distribution of serotines is about, because we don't know much about this species in Essex. Um, and so we're looking at the uh, population health and distribution, trying to identify sort of important areas for serotine in the county and looking at habitats and what habitats are important for them. Um, and then identifying uh, the sort of distribution, how they use buildings in the, in the um, county. So we're looking at known records 
um, the, the sort of modelling habitats and also conducting targeted surveys. And so Sarah and a team of volunteers have been out, um, they've surveyed across Essex and across 30 different sites, doing activity surveys and building inspections um, and um, emergent surveys. And the yellow and red have come back negative, but we've had some reconfirmed um, roosts and we had a new roost found in the north um, east of Essex as well. Okay, great. Yes, so you've got me for a little bit longer. Um, apologies. So um, yes, I was, just thought I'd tag on the uh, Hearts and Middlesex back group spotlight session at the end of this talk. Um, so uh, obviously the Barbastel project is, is a major um, project that we're involved in, but there's quite a few other activities that we undertake um, as a back group in Hertfordshire, uh, Hearts and Middlesex. So Middlesex is, is a bit of an odd area. And I think with the Wildlife Trust it sort of goes around um, sort of the northwest of London around towards Rickmansworth, just shy of, of Heathrow. Um, so uh, that includes that whole um, area as well as Hertfordshire. So we've mentioned the Barbastel project in detail already. There's another project that we are contributing towards, which is the Hearts Mammal Amphibian Reptile Atlas project. So this is uh, really trying to get records of um, all these groups and create, publishing an atlas. So we are contributing towards that and getting all of our records sorted. Um, we're also involved in quite a bit of monitoring. We've got various bat box schemes around the county. Um, and uh, I'm trying to collate a whole um, database of where all of these are so we can sort of get a bit more of a grip of what's happening and get the monitoring up to date. We contribute quite a lot to the um, National Bat Monitoring Program, particularly with um, a number of hibernation sites that we have. Um, and I've just got a little video. Let's see if this is going to actually work. Um, of one of our sites, it's one of our largest by far hibernation sites in Hertfordshire. And uh, it involves going down a mine shaft, um, which is about I think, 20 meters down. And uh, it's a big old chalk mine, um, lots of caverns. It takes us a day to survey this um, in the winter. We do it three times a year, December, January, February. And uh, there's a lot of training involved in getting our members down here. because a lot of rope techniques, a lot of... Um, uh, setting up of all of these uh, uh, contraptions to get us down. So we have various training sessions, up trees and up down trees, abseiling training and ladder training. Um, and uh, we get a lot of bats down here. Um, as I said, it takes us quite a few hours, about five or six hours um, underground in the pitch black. And uh, yeah, if you don't like heights, it's uh, not the best place to go down. But anyway, this just gives you a, a, an idea of, of what's involved when uh, we head on down this mine shaft and spend the day down there. So let's see. So no video down the bottom. Goodbye. Well, so this is just uh, this is a bit of a busy graph, apologies. Um, but this is just a quick summary I was putting together of the records from uh, this hibernation site that uh, we're just mentioning there and how many bats we get um, in it. So I've really started being involved in this site since 2014 and sort of had access to collating all those records. So the, the blue lines, I suppose, are the ones we're really interested in here with the details showing you the difference between natras and dorbentons, which are the main species we get down there, along with brown long-eared. Um, and then I pop temperature in the little yellow um, sort of boxes. Um, so, and then you'll see, I suppose, the dates. So there's a January, February, January, February, um, and then January, February. And then you can start a December, January, February, because we started doing December in 2016 as well. Um, so the numbers of bats have actually increased to January. Um, in the last few years, we had a few less, but we had a maximum number of bats of about 130 bats down there um, in 2019 on a very, very cold day. So you can see the temperature seriously drops. So I think it's, it's, it's quite in interesting to note that when you're doing your, your hibernation surveys, the colder the temperature outside, it seems the, the, the more bats you're going to be encountering on some occasions. So uh, that is our Shenley Hibernation Survey. We've got a number of other sites that are really small and only a few bats, but this is really our key one that we focus on every year. Um, a project we just started this year, actually, during lockdown, um, was our Bat Patrol project. And I unashamedly say that I stole the idea from Bed's Bat Group. So sorry, Bob. Um, these uh, Piersonic Bat Detectors, relatively affordable in that they can automatically record um, bats as you're doing a little walkabout. 
Um, so combined with the GPS that allows us to give these out, these packs to uh, members and members of the public, um, and they can do a bat walk around their local area and send us back the kit and we can download and then get um, uh, new records. And this will contribute to obviously our records that uh, we submit to the Environmental Records Center and provides them to developers, but also will contribute to the Atlas project that I mentioned earlier. So it's been very successful. It's been quite popular. Lots of people have taken these out um, and we've got a lot more records. Um, obviously it means a lot more work in producing reports and maps and everything to sort of feedback to those who've done the surveys uh, and also to collate those records, but it actually is um, working out really, really well. Um, so we're quite happy with that. The other thing the BAT group is really involved in, and we've got a very strong team um, around BAT care. Um, so uh, I think this year we had at least 100 bats coming in to care. Um, this is just a breakdown of the species. So mostly pipistrels um, and then soprano pipistrels, uh, common pipistrels and then in the blue and then soprano pipistrels in the orange and then a few brown longeards. But this year we've actually had a few interesting species, Dorbentons, Natras and Barbastel also came into care. Um, which was quite interesting. Here's this, my funny little natras. Actually, I was quite excited to have a natras and a very, very uh, hungry natras. Just wanted to, you know, had no problems with picking up mealworms and eating them. It just went for them all the time. Uh, we had quite a few babies, unfortunately, coming in as well. One roost turned out to be particularly difficult this year. Um, in uh, discovered in Rickmansworth, um, one of our members, Jane, unfortunately, was picking up a baby bat every two days and I think at the end of the day she had about 11 from this roost which was pretty um, awful. The bats were appearing in people's flats, there's a big complex of flats and she counted 458 soprano pipistrels coming out of the gable of this um, flat complex. So there's quite a few problems there we're trying to work through with the management committee to try and see that this doesn't happen again next year. Uh, there's just a sort of a summary of the uh, ratios of male to female bats coming into care. So it's the usual ratio of more males and females. Um, whatever that means at the end of the day is, is always the question. Um, and I think that about summarizes everything. If I just go back quickly to this page here, um, it's just sort of the, uh, I think I've said most of these things. We also do quite a lot of shows usually, but obviously this year we didn't do any, and a lot of bat walks and a lot of outreach, but a lot of that didn't happen, though we did a lot of things online actually. Um, quite a few uh, talks and training sessions and outreach online. Um, through our monthly social sessions and we have managed to do some training in sound analysis so with all of our recordings we need lots of people to help us analyze our recordings so we've been trying to build up a, um, a group of, of um, people in the, in the county who are able to do that and help us with those. I think that's sort of quickly sums it up, thank you very much. Brilliant, thank you very much Chantal. Okay, um, I don't have a vast amount to say which is good uh, partly because there's a lot we haven't been able to do this year, but we did quite a lot of things last year, so I'll try and say a bit about those. So that's our logo now. Um, we've done a lot with the Methusias project over the years, and one of the highlights of last year was at one of our regular trapping sites, we trapped the individual shown here. This is the standard three pip species photo that everyone takes. But this bat was one that we caught in uh, 2015 as a juvenile, ringed him, and then he popped it up in a trap last year. Um, and it was very nice to see because he was healthy, a good weight, and was building up to peak breeding conditions. So that was a very satisfying thing last year. Um, as soon as lockdown hit, of course, everything came to a halt. Something I started doing was to stick a bat detector out of my loft window every night for a while uh, just to see what was about and that graph shows the bat passes more or less every night from the 2nd of April to the 9th of June. Um, very, very variable as I guess you'd expect but I posted it on our local Natural History Society website and um, got some interesting responses and people started to send me information about bat sightings in their gardens during lockdown. Um, this amazing photograph of a brown long-eared foraging during daylight uh, was sent to me by a member of the Natural History Society who saw that during the lockdown period and I'm still amazed by it. Um, last year we did quite a lot of work at Whipsnade Zoo and the trigger for this was one of our newer members, Tyrone Capel, here on the right, 
who works at Whipsnade, and is very good at lobbying the, um, the Zoom management about things. And as a result, we, we've been able, we've always done a bit of work at Whipsnade, but we've been able to do a lot more there. This photograph um, was taken when we cleared out one of the, one of the high vernacular there and installed some new fan-shaped bat boxes. Um, we also, thanks to Tyrone, found bats using a new structure that is new to us, not new to um, the bats, obviously. But this is a, a hibernation structure. It's a disused tunnel thing. I don't know what purpose it once served in the zoo, but it's not used anymore. But um, bats started turning up in it. And the real surprise was one of these. It seems to be the theme for the day, Barbastales, but this is the first time we found a Barbastale hibernating at Whipsnade. So that's very good news. Um, other things, well, we've done a lot of bat rescue, as most groups have this year, and it's been a very busy year, and I think everyone's found that. Um, this was a, a tally I did the other day by contacting our two main bat carers. This isn't everyone, so there will, there will be more bats that are not shown on here. Um, but we, we've had really quite a lot of bats, nearly all pips, but a few brown long ears. And again, to bring things back to the zoo, two of those brown long ears were found in Whipsnade Zoo and were successfully released. It was a, a mother and juvenile. Um, but the zoo made quite a lot of this and put stuff on Facebook, so they got publicity uh, from it, uh, which is good because it it encourages them to focus a bit more on the bats in their sight. Um, Chantal said that she had stolen the idea of these surveys from us, um, which is fine because perfectly happy for people to use them. But we've been doing these surveys for several years now where people walk around or sometimes drive around with a Pearsonic and a GPS. And we use them in two different ways. We use them by uh, repeatedly going to sites we've got a particular interest in and we also use them to try to cover areas we wouldn't otherwise go. But this was done last year at Whipsnade Zoo and it involved a walk around and finding bats in a variety of places and it, it's really been quite productive because we found species other than the usual common pips, um, cluster of myotis bats, some of which we could positively identify as as Dorbentons near this pond. So again, that ties in with what we've been doing at Whipsnade. And we have managed to do some of those this year once the, lock, the main lockdown ended. Um, bats in churches. Um, I think I'm the only person actually that's been involved in this, but, but we have got involved in the project this year and I've done surveys in several churches. This is Swine's Head Church, which is one of the, um, one of the main project churches and there's a Pearsonic in place and been very productive. That recording from that Pearsonic picked up four species of bat, though I think only two or three are actually roosting in the church. And that's it really. Okay, so I'm Nathan. I'm going to do a talk from the Suffolk Bat Group. Um, and it, this is kind of touching on from a project that we started kind of last year and it's kind of finished this year, um, which makes a nice change. So First of all, a big thank you to the Suffolk Wildlife Trust because they gave us access to their nature reserve at Bonnie Wood, um, but also ESPIS because they actually funded this whole project going forward. So to give you a bit of a background about Bonnie Wood, it's located near Needham Market in the middle of Suffolk, and it's an ancient woodland um, that is, basically has a really good population of hazel door mice. Door, door mice. So it's really well managed for them um, and is regularly coppiced. So the woodland is kind of this area in the middle and it's partly owned by the Wildlife Trust and also part privately owned. So the Wildlife Trust owned the area in red. And in 2019, we conducted some activity surveys that basically involved several people standing throughout the woodland and basically recording what was present. So these are the species that we found. And basically what they recorded was most of the bats were actually coming sometime after they emerged, suggesting that they were actually roosting elsewhere, but then arriving in the woodland to forage and commute. So we thought, right, well, how can we 
improve the woodland for bats? How can we make it better and of more use for them? So as I was suggesting earlier, it's actually to do with limited roosting opportunities. The woodland's really heavily managed for dormice, so there's a lot of hazel coppice. And although there are some large oak strands, they're not massively common and they haven't got the features that you would in other typical ancient woodlands. So because of this, we thought, right, we need to come up with an idea. Now, we didn't want to put up loads of boxes and for them to then be all used by dormice. So we wanted to kind of have a mix that the dormice can also use their boxes in the woodland, but also the bats can use the ones that we put up. So after a bit of research, speaking to other bat groups and consultants, we basically found out that where woodland is heavily managed um, and with quite a dense understory, hazel dormice will tend to stay in their natural nest in that understory. When the understory becomes more scarce, that's when the hazel dormice tend to move up into the canopy and start using bat boxes. And what other consultants and bat groups have found is those that have a cavity like the standard 2F boxes I tend to use more by dormice than, for example, a 1FF or a Kemp bat box or something similar, which is kind of open um, at the bottom. So the reason why we suggest, well, we've decided to go with a 2F box is one, because they're a lot cheaper than a 1FF box. Um, but also we needed a box that would actually stay a lot longer. We do projects at Fetford Forests and their timber boxes and they're now starting to heavily need changing on a regular basis. So we wanted a box that we could easily put up and we can lower down from the tree to allow for an easy inspection. So we went around with Giles, this is in the bottom left hand corner, from who's the warden at Bonnywood. And we basically picked out various trees and you can see here on the photo on the right just how dense that understory is. And you've got these small groups of mature oak trees, but again, not with many particular features. So in September this year, we've went out a small group of us, found out where the trees were and have decided to put up all 30 bat boxes um, facing north, southeast and southwest. So again, you can see on the left just how dense that understory is and on the right where you've got these rides, we've located the bat boxes. So hopefully once BCT give the go ahead again, we'll start checking these boxes and working out what species are actually using them. And that's all I've got to say. Lovely. Okay, so yep, I'm just going to give you a very quick rundown on some of the activities the group has been involved with over the last year or so, mainly centred on project work, uh, work with the MBMP surveys, our bat box and hibernation checks and sort of public engagement that we've been involved with. So as Jane has already said, a, a real focus for Norwich Bat Group has been the National Anesthesia's Pipistrelle Project which we joined in 2017. Um, it's been hugely popular with our members and gives a really great opportunity for people to get up close and personal with bats at some really interesting sites. Um, that's all I'm actually gonna say about it because we've just had a, a lovely talk about it. So the uh, National Bat Monitoring Programme, we were really keen to set up regular monitoring of a site. We wanted something really cool and exciting for people to sort of get them engaged in this kind of survey work and hopefully encourage them to set up their own sites for monitoring. Uh, thankfully we had the fantastic Spitsworth Church with their very large common pipistrelle colony and we very kindly agreed for some of our members to use their building for roost counts over the summer um, and it's just been really lovely. Whilst most people have an experience of sort of a couple of bats flying around in their gardens at night I don't think many people have really seen huge colonies squeezing out of a, a tiny gap in the roof by a downpipe. So I think we've had sort of 400, 500 bats coming out and it's been really lovely to see sort of members really engaging with this kind of survey work. Um, we've also been on a bit of a bat box mission recently, trying to set up as many as possible in a wide variety of sites, such as nature reserves and cemeteries. We needed lots of boxes to cover all our sites and we've had some donations from the Boards Authority, Essex and Suffolk Water, as well as some lovely donations made by uh, local men's in sheds groups and uh, nearly a hundred from the husband of one of our members. So thank you, Tom, well done. We've already had good results from some of the sites. Uh, in January, 2019, we had 20 put up at Whitlingham Broad and checks later in the year found evidence that bats are using seven of these with soprano prepper cells found in another four. 
So overall, we've had 151 boxes put up, which are now subject to annual monitoring. Um, we've been continuing with hibernation checks across the county at our regular sites, um, and we've also been sort of liaising with other organisations such as Norfolk Wildlife Trust and some of the larger states like Holcombe to set up uh, monitoring some of their potential sites. Um, another action of our group has been to try and establish a comprehensive database of all known or potential hibernation sites in the county so we can kind of create a really cohesive monitoring program because it's all a bit sort of sporadic at the moment. Um, we've now got, I think it's over 135 known or potential sites, which you know range from caves to lime kilns to tiny cellars. So I think there's going to be some busy winters up ahead when we're actually allowed to get out and about again. Um, we've had our usual walks and talks, including several at local schools, which have been really fun. We've established a quarterly newsletter to keep in touch with our members about what's going on. Um, with COVID sort of signing most attempts to do public engagement, we've been trying to come up with new ways for our group to keep members and the general public engaged with BATS. One of these has been to set up a BATS care blog. Um, which we've been using to promote interesting stories about bats coming in through the bat helpline um, and which we've also used to raise awareness of issues with bats. Um, I've got, if it works, some terrible footage. I do apologise, it's a very poor camera that this was recorded on. But there's a bat, baby bat in the top right corner here. Uh, this was us trying to reunite a baby with a mother. Um, the baby got very excited when mum finally appeared. It was a tense uh, hour and a half before there was much activity, but uh, eventually mum checked it was definitely her baby, uh, gave them a quick feed and then flew off. And it was just really nice to kind of share these stories with people more wildly because it, it's it's lovely. People seem really enthused about, about seeing these kind of things. And we in particular were quite keen for the mum to take it away as we then didn't have to do any raising of the pups, which is very welcome. We also ran an art competition with the theme Bats in Dark Skies. Um, we had some really fabulous entries. I've just got a couple of uh, drawings to show you, um, which is just lovely for these to have come in from schools and nurseries and just um, kids that are members of the groups. Um, we're going to have four winners, which I think have been selected, but they haven't been told that they are winners yet. Um, and they'll be given bat boxes, uh, which will be donated by the group. Uh, and that was it very quick from Norwich Bat Group. But uh, if anyone wants to join us in the area, do get in touch with us. Hello today, come find us. Um, and I also want to say thank you to the other Spotlight presenters in particular, because I look forward to stealing all of your ideas and trying to um, incorporate them into Norfolk. OK, well, thanks, everybody. Um, a quick, very quick um, Spotlight on Cambridgeshire Bat Group. <laughs> Um, it's fair to say that uh, a, a lot of our activities have been on in, in field work um, and also that we haven't done much this year. Um, but as we haven't had a regional conference for, what, two and a half years, I can talk about last year as well. Um, so we've, we've done quite a lot of um, uh, trapping surveys. Um, in various places, Haley Wood and other sites, um, and also uh, part of the, um, for two reasons, part of our, our small myotis project that we've got going, where we want to try and uh, identify, you know, whiskered brants, which we know we've got in places, but we just got very, very few records of them. So we've been doing quite a few uh, trapping sessions with that. Um, and we've also been helping out with the Rockingham Forest Back to the Brink project. Um, and through that, we've, um, we have confirmed whiskered bat at, uh, at one site at Bedford Purlews, um, and we're hoping we were hoping to do quite a bit more. Um, we've um, we were planning to do a, a big bat weekend, a big bat bash, as we were calling it, um, this uh, in the last year. But obviously, COVID and everything else has put paid to that, so we had to postpone that. But that was going to be. Uh, uh, a weekend of, of bat trapping and, and recording on, on lots of the woods that we haven't really surveyed much at all in, in sort of Rockingham Forest area, the area sort of north, northwest of Peterborough and, and that sort of area. Um, 
<clears throat> We've continued um, to monitor our quite large roost of nocturnals in March, which many of you will know, know about. Um, some recent years, um, the, the counts of this roost have been a little bit disappointing, um, but in 2019, um, the counts did peak at 107 bats, which was, uh, which was quite nice, and that was the highest number that we've actually recorded there for, for certainly several years, um, so that, that's something that's ongoing. Um, managed to get the uh, regular hibernation surveys done last winter um, and that, that went reasonably well. Um, certainly uh, the, uh, the 10 sites that I check sort of south, southwest, southeast of Cambridge um, went, went quite well. We had um, uh, not, nothing too exceptional but we had 141 bats in, in January um, which was quite nice but we had a um, bit of a problem on the February check with the with the storms and whatnot um one of the site at least one site we couldn't get to because of all the trees that were falling around us um but we did get through and we did have a nice whiskered bat in one of our sites which is the Islam lime kiln um so that's uh, something that is you know quite unusual for us we do, we really don't record many many whiskered whiskered brants in in Cambridgeshire so that that was nice in fact that bat was present in that site on the descent on the January and the February check so that that was nice um, apart from that um, we haven't really done an awful lot this year um, in 2020. Um, one of us loaned out some static detectors to a few members, which generated quite a few useful records. So we did manage to keep some survey work going. Um, another aspect of our group, which is quite big, is on um, bat care. Um, our busiest carer had 106 uh, or has had 106 bats in for care this year already. Um, we're still not obviously at the end of the year, we're still getting bats coming in, um, but it's 106 so far. Um, 70 of those were released, so that's quite a good, good success rate. Um, and um, that number is about three times the number of casualties or grounded bats that we normally get in, which we think is um, interesting. Um, quite possibly because of the lockdown since, when was it, 23rd of March or whatever it was, um, people are at home a lot more, they're, they're watching what their cats are doing a lot more, um, and we certainly seem to have had, as I say, three, three times the normal number of sort of grounded bats, so not sure whether other bat groups have found similar. Um, quite a lot, um, quite a lot of... Um, the or the majority of, of cases have, have been as, as a result of cats. Um, but also um, road traffic accidents as well. Um, so we think collisions with vehicles, which was interesting, which is up on most normal normal years. And, and again, we think it might well be because of the, uh, the fact that the roads were very much quieter earlier in the year and over the summer. Um, and bats are perhaps venturing out over, over roads a lot more than they would have done um, normally. Um, so that was, uh, that was bat care. That was what, that's really what we've been doing this year. What we're, what we're still hoping to do, um, we're really hoping to get back to normal. We're hoping this uh, will be next year now. We're hoping that we can get back and concentrate on our trapping um, for both the small myotis and also continue with the Nathusia's Pippa Straw project, uh, none of which was done, I don't think any was done in 2019, but we're hoping to carry on that. Um, and it'd be nice to get out with, uh, with some people and actually do stuff. Um, we're also hoping to do um, some radio tracking of our nocturnals at March, um, particularly uh, find out if they've if they if they go anywhere near or have any problems with the the numerous wind turbines that are in that area. But get, getting out and doing normal things, as I say, to get people involved, check bat boxes, continue with the hibernation surveys. We all desperately want to get back and doing that. Um, 
I'm also still hoping to do some renovation work on one of our ice houses, um, which we've been quite successful with in the past. And there's two examples shown here. Um, what else? Um, we're also hoping to get um, a lot more uh, volunteers involved in monitoring maternity roofs for the um, NBMP. Um, but again, all, all, all hoping that things do turn, you know, turn back to normal. Um, that's really all I wanted to say, really. Um, Norfolk Bubble Cell Study Group, we're a bit different from other bat groups in that we're very much just one species focused. So um, uh, I haven't got a great deal to tell you, that's for a couple of reasons. First of all, um, uh, we haven't been able to do anything in 2020 because the majority or the core of our work is um, radio tracking. So COVID has put a, a stop to that. Um, there was work done um, after the last Spotlight talk, so that's uh, 2018 and 19, but that is now written up and it was quite a milestone for us to get that done. So um, we basically reviewed all the work we've done, largely radio tracking from 2011 uh, up to date and that was published um, earlier this year and we've got it in British Island Bats and the Norfolk Bird and Mammal Report which is a more local um, place. So um, if you've read that you'll be pretty well up to date with where we are. Um, but uh, even so I'll just run through what we're doing and our future uh, objectives. Radio tracking is the core of our work because we are trying to identify habitat and landscape features that are so important for barber cells in Norfolk. So we look for maternity colonies and then we study those colonies to look at roost characteristics, colony size, behaviour, where they forage, how they move around, what areas they need to support the colony. And we're quite interested in interactions between colonies. So where we have um, small isolated woodlands, do they use groups of woodlands? Uh, do they move around between woodlands? So um, we're dependent on working with landowners and land managers, and that has been very successful in finding new survey sites. And by working with them, we're hoping we're able to promote better understanding and improve management of other cells. So this is where we are now. Uh, we know of a total of 24 maternity colonies. And you'll notice from Lottie's talk, uh, there's another two to make it 26. That's from the work she's doing um, on the north side, northwest side of Norwich. But for the 24, um, we have uh, 21 that the group have found, uh, plus uh, the others from uh, work by various consultants. That's uh, mainly for the Northern Distributor Road, Northwest Link. And one of yours, Chris, was down at San Sacklium some time ago. Mm -hmm. So um, we've got pretty good coverage apart from the broads. We don't know anything about um, much about the broads apart from the isolated one up at Calthorpe. The woodlands are different here. They're wet woodlands with predominantly willow and alder. So we don't know quite what potential they've got in terms of roosts. Um, on the west side, we haven't done very much except at Ken Hill. Um, so we were all primed to work at a site over on the west um, this year, but that fell through because of COVID. We had two other sites in South Norfolk where we have these smaller isolated woodlands, some of them uh, only 10 hectares or less, uh, but they still support Barbastel. So we were gonna fill in some gaps there. We've got partnerships with um, Norfolk Wildlife Trust, particularly to who, who put us in contact with the county wildlife site owners. And then we assess the sites and follow up with radio tracking if they look good. And that allows the, um, the trust to give better tailored advice to the landowners and it feeds into their living landscapes initiatives. Then over on the west, we in the past to work on the Ken Hill estate, but that recently changed hands. And now there is a big rewilding project for it. So we're in contact with the new owners. We have quite a lot of baseline data from there and we hope to help them going forwards with their rewilding and their woodland management or lack of management, whichever is most appropriate. So advice and advocacy, if you've read the review, you'll see there's a very detailed table, table three right here, far, far too detailed to actually go into, but it identifies a whole lot of areas 
where there are not only threats to barber cells in Norfolk, but also opportunities. So we're hoping to work towards that with um, various organisations or down to even individuals. We're also represented on the Norwich Western Link Ecology Liaison Group for this very controversial road, which has potential very damaging impacts on barber cells. Uh, and our work also um, feeds into um, assessments for wind farm projects and various developments in Norfolk. So future plans, hopefully if we can get going again, we'll be looking at colonies for colonies in West Norfolk and the Broads. We have, if we can get good, good coverage over all of Norfolk, we're thinking possibly in terms of a, a developing a risk map for barber cells in Norfolk. We're keen to look to continue looking at in the importance of the smaller woodlands, not to ignore those at all, and increase, increasing awareness of barber cells in small woodlands, particularly county wildlife sites. And our um, aims are to promote, promote better management at all scales, the landscape, land management scheme, for example, farm clusters and down to individuals. So we'll be pressing on with that, hopefully, uh, in the future. Thank you.